Tonight I rejoice in the privilege of another birthday, giving the story of that which Jesus has done for me. He has done great things for you, of course. And yet to each one of us, it seems as though God has done something more personal and real, perhaps, than to another. Tonight, I choose as my text Isaiah, the sixth chapter, and the familiar passage of Scripture, the eighth verse. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. It was some distance away on a Canadian farm in Ontario five miles from our nearest town of Ingersoll, that I was born and brought up as a farmer's daughter. I was the only boy on the farm, the only girl on the farm. Many of the little homey tasks fell to my doing. I wouldn't have missed that training and opportunity for anything in the world, for I always find my mind and my idioms of speech harping back to the farm. Days of skiing, days of snowshoeing, Days of flying ice skates over the ponds and the rivers. Days of school, walking five miles or riding horseback five miles or riding in the cutter the five miles to and from the distant town. This whipped up good roses in youthful Canadian cheeks and I've always been very thankful to my precious bringing up a home for a good sound body. I was brought up on oatmeal porridge with good brown sugar and thick frozen cream. That's the way to bring any child up, to give them something to work on in afterlife, I verily believe. it. My life was steeped with church training. There was a family altar in our home. I was brought up with one foot in the Methodist church, you might say, and the other foot in the Salvation Army, which was brand new in our part of the country then. And yet I had never been born again. Strangely enough, it was in my own Methodist church, while preparing for choir service, that I took my first little step or two in dancing. Yet I thought I might be doing wrong until I had my first dance. And then I knew dancing was all right. My people were old-fashioned. By the first dance I had, my partner was a young Presbyterian minister. Must be all right. <laughs> and <laughs> at school one day, however, struck a snag in my rather smooth-flowing life that our teacher had introduced, as he had to many classes before me, evolution. I believe, to the best of my knowledge, that this went over the heads of many other students, but it stuck in mine. Until one day I came with my Bible in one hand and my school book in the other and said, tell me please, which is right, the Bible or the school book? They're certainly diametrically opposed. The school book says that we sprang from the animal origin, came from the depths of the ocean, from the growth of the fungus and so forth, and amoeba, whereas the Bible declares that we were formed of God, the great creator, who breathed into us the breath of life. Which, sir, is right? Little girl, your Bible is a classic, the gem of English literature, and as such should always be read and kept. As for its authenticity and its accuracy, no, no. That's mythology, written by men of long ago. Take your school books, and you will find that that is correct. Little girl, I haven't time to pursue the subject any further now. Sir, I wish you would, because it, it, it just kind of rocked my little world. I've always been taught there was a God, and taught to pray, and to believe that Bible is the Word of God. Here I am in a good Canadian school, and it's teaching the opposite. Tell me if you're in a hurry, how can I be sure the school book is right and the Bible wrong? He quickly wrote off the names of several other books that I might peruse. I found myself in the library reading Huxley, Darwin, Paine, Ingersoll. And then with my head all abuzz like a beehive, I went home to my dad. And he was coming up from the cellar for the big pan of milk to skim. And I met him at the top and I said, Dad, how do you know there's a God? He, he said he was so surprised he pretty near fell back for the moment. But he came up and sat down and said, what do you mean? said, just what you say. Oh, my life, you said, there is a God, and my parents believe in a God. Now, how do you know? Have you ever seen him? Has anybody else ever seen him? Has he ever done anything to prove that he is existing? 
Darling, who do you think made the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth? Oh, I said, Dad, the school book explains all those. The sun, moon, and stars were all one mass of hot molten lava. They began because of a heat, a whirling motion. And as they whirled in their liquid form, the sun flew off and the stars flew off and the earth flew off and we flew off and here we are. He said, whoa, <laughs> uh, how did man come out of the scene, my dear? Of course, you wouldn't understand this, Daddy. This is something new that it had since your age that just discovered these things. But age upon age, another million years, another five million years, old Father, these evolutionists are certainly the most generous people you ever saw. They'll give you 20 million more years without batting an eyelash any time you want it. And as a million years went by, the uh, reptiles came up on the shore and set up a feather factory and turned into birds. And the... Um, Beasts of the field set up a hair factory, and they all turned into different stripes or kind. Well, he says, that's a wonderful thing to think of that, because there's no such thing as transmutation of the species now. It, it's impossible. You cannot cross any animals and have them live. I said, well, Daddy, how about our mule? Well, he said, there it ends. You may cross the horse, the little old lowly donkey, and produce the mule, but the mule cannot produce its kind. You're in a stone wall. I don't believe that school book at all. I believe the Bible. My heart was still confused. About this time, there were many other happy things to do, and I thought, well, I'll brush the whole thing aside. But my parents were anxious about me. They said, now, you should go to different churches. Now, we're going to take you to first one and then the other. They took me to the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, Salvation Army. And I remember one night a revival was in progress, and I had an appointment to be at the fancy dress skating carnival that night. But they insisted that I be at the revival meeting at a certain hour to go home. And the daughter of the evangelist came up to me. Said, darling, are you a Christian? I said, no, I go to high school. And she said, what's that to do with it? I said, don't you read evolution? How can you believe that our same country could teach the Bible and teach the evolutionary theory? That's undermining our faith in God. Why, well, she said, you poor girl. You stay here till I get my mother to talk to you. She brought her mother off. She was a sweet-faced lady. And she talked to me for about a minute. And then she said, you poor girl, you wait here till I get my husband. And she brought the preacher. He was very lovely, too, and very logical and very cool in his deliberations and measurings up and summarizings. And finally, he had me backed right off into one trench. And all I could say was, well, Reverend, that may be true. But if the Bible is true... Why do taxpayers pay good money to have our children taught every day in school that God did not create the earth and all that therein is? He said, I don't know. I went home that night. I knew that I deeply wounded and offended the faith that had been put within me. I didn't like to hurt people. I went upstairs to my own bedroom. I got down on my knees. It was a snowy, cold, wintry night. The blanket of snow was everywhere on the Canadian hills. And I threw up my window and looked out. I could almost touch the apple trees that were encased in ice. And I put my hands up and I began to say, without knowing I was going to say it, Oh, God, if there be a God, reveal yourself to me. Oh, how often that prayer has been prayed. And I believe God always answers it. He answered it for me within a few hours. I heard some of the young people of the high school talking about a revival meeting being put on by Reverend Robert Semple, who had the Holy Spirit, and the people down there were clapping their hands and shouting amen and hallelujah, and they said, really, you should go, it's, a, it's lots of fun. So I had a little time to go, and I said to my father, let's step into the mission. And as I stepped inside, Robert Semple was preaching. Ooh, how that man could preach. Acts 2.38 Looked as if he was boring me right through with a sword. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promises unto you and your children. And to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And as he preached, why, say, to hear that man preach, you'd believe there was a difference between a Christian and a sinner. I'd never noticed much. He simply drew a straight line through the world. And you must be born again. Then suddenly, this man began to speak in another tongue as the Spirit gave him utterance. And I had never heard anything like that. And my eyes flew open. I just sat and looked at him. 
And to me it was as though God said, You are a poor, lost, miserable sinner. Ooh, I said, Daddy, let's get out of here. I said, I thought you wanted to come here. I said, I do, but I want to leave now. How I ever got through the rehearsal at the town hall that night for a Christmas performance, I don't know. But I do know that for three days, God followed me. The third day going home from school, I said, Lord, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I'll tell you, I felt as though heaven was going to fall on me and crush me to death and that I was going to lose my soul in hell. But when I cried out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, the glory of God flooded over my soul. I was there alone on the country road in the cutter, the horse jogging along. I could feel the warm, cleansing blood of Jesus flowing over me. I could feel his glorious, saving grace. And I began to sing. And, oh, glory be to God, I was saved. Big tears rolled down my face, dripped upon my gauntlets as I held the reins. When I went home, I had a regular bonfire. I got hold of my novels, and I got hold of some of my sheet music of the worldly old songs, and I'll tell you, Alexander's Ragtime Band, and the rest of them all had to go by the board, and I began putting them in the soul. And I began to read my Bible, How to Be a Soul Winner. So I found that every one in the Bible that became real soul winners of the New Testament were, first of all, filled with the Holy Ghost. They needed the baptism of power from on high. Did I pray? Oh, I said, Lord, here's the promise. And they were all assembled. And there came a sound of a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Lord, fill me now. And I prayed for a whole week. And then, glory to God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost struck my soul. And again, I was all alone in a home. Five o'clock in the morning when the Lord baptized me and I never shall forget how the fire fell. I could see my wonderful Savior hanging on the cross for me. And I remember there was just a puddle of tears when I fell under the power of God. And the Lord filled me with the desire to win souls. I feel absolutely responsible for India and China and Ceylon and South America and the ends of the earth. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Lord, I never heard of a woman preacher. They're all men. I don't know why. Why wasn't I a man? I'd like to be a young man so I'd go out and preach. Lord, can say, just hold your peace now. The evangelist, Robert Temple, under whom I'd been converted, who had been in Stratford, came back to Ingersoll. And while I was sitting up with some sick children, he opened the door and walked in. I said, now, how do you do, Reverend Temple? He said, how do you do? I said, I'm here to sit up with the sick children. I thought you were in Stratford. He said, I was, but I'm here for a day or two. I'm here to sit up with the sick children. I said, I'm glad you're back in town, but I'm here to sit up with the children. He said, well, we'll both sit up with the children. So <laughs> he sat down for a while and prayed for the children who were tossing feverishly. Then he looked at me, those wide Irish blue eyes, and he said, uh, how is it with your soul? I said, oh, I've been receiving those letters you've sent to all the converts. I've been reading all the scriptures you've sent, and I have been baptized with the Holy Ghost. And, oh, brother, I just seem to see sinners going by like a great black river without God. And now that I have been saved, I want to reach out and help bring others in. He said, God bless you. I picked up my school geography lying there, and I see here's a map of China. You know, I'm, I'm going as a missionary to China. Oh, I said, you are. Mm, isn't that wonderful? I wish I were going to as a missionary to China or someplace for the Lord. I have such a burning in my soul to be a soul winner, and I don't know where to start. And he said, would you really like to? And I said, oh, how I'd love it, anywhere for Jesus. He reached out and covered my hand with his big, competent hand, and he said, Amy, I love you. That's what I've come back to tell you. Will you marry me and go with me to China? He said, now, just a moment before you answer... Let's both kneel down by the settee here and ask the Lord about it. I never heard of a proposal like that before or after in all my life. <laughs> and we both kneel down. Robert prayed. I couldn't for the lump in my throat to save me. But he prayed, and I shut my eyes really tight. And when I opened them, I could see a long road leading up to glory, and Robert and I were going up the road together. I opened my eyes. What's that thing there? It must be imagination. It was just a, just a wallpaper. I closed my eyes again, and there was the road. Only this time, I was going up the road alone. Robert didn't seem to be there. 
I didn't understand it all, but I opened my eyes and I said yes to God and yes to Robert. There was a wedding on the Canadian farm shortly thereafter under the golden bough under the apple trees. And happily, I went away behind the white ribbons that fluttered at the whip of the old buggy. And Robert Semple was out to do the preaching of the word of the living God. Hallelujah. Oh, I was just a preacher's wife, but was I learning. He was my Bible school. You know, at night when the day was over, he just sat down and teach me from the word of God. I'd read it before, but now with the Holy Spirit, it was new. He preached in Chicago. He preached in Canada. Preached on the Indian Reservation, back in Chicago. And then he said, now, dear, I feel we have to leave for China. And he began farewelling in the different churches. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. We're leaving for China, landing first at Hong Kong and then going on inland. It is while we were in the island of Macau, preaching the gospel, that Robert took so violently ill, was finally taken back to Hong Kong. I was taken back, ravaged with malaria, and up to the top of the hill to Matilda Hospital, where missionaries are not allowed to pay a penny, I think, ever for their care. God bless whoever Matilda was who inspired that haven of rest, cleanliness, good food, no worry for a moment. No to the rising and the falling of that, woo, that malaria fever. Have you ever seen the real article, the tropical kind that makes everything jingle in the whole building, it seems? And then the day they came to me and said, Sister, you may take tea with your husband tonight. Oh, I said, you're so good to me. Well, this isn't visiting day. I didn't know why they were so good. Until Robert, looking up, his eyes seemed a lot larger than they'd been, very much bluer. And his Bible opened. He said, darling, what would you do if anything should happen to me? Robert, don't talk like that. Well, nothing could happen to you, dear. We're called into the work. His face was convulsed for a moment. And the nurse came and said, my dear, you have to go back. You're tiring him. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to. And I stood at the foot of his bed and I said, oh, good night, dear. Suddenly, Robert's face was calm as a lake after a storm. He smiled up and said, good night, dear. I'll see you in the morning. Those are the last words he ever spoke to me. But there will be a morning, won't there? In the middle of the night, about two, they came and called me. Somehow my knees just wouldn't hold me up. They seemed to turn to rubber all of a sudden. But when I reached his ward, I stood by his bed and saw that he was unconscious, and yet he was smiling. Somehow I, I fell, but I caught his hand as I went. And I said, Robert, you, you couldn't leave me here. Not, not now. And suddenly they said, he's gone. I knew I was going to scream, but before I could, the Lord swept over my soul and put his arms of comfort about me, and I found my stiff lips saying, the Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A month later, after he had died, my little baby was born. I gathered her up in my arms, and I went when she was six weeks of age to Happy Valley to visit the grave where the body of Robert was lying. I'd never really seen anybody die, and I just didn't know what to do. I hadn't had any money, but I'd been praying for it. And the very next day after Robert had died, a letter had come in from Chicago. A woman had said, darling, what on earth's the matter with you? The Lord waking me up in the middle of the night, and I have to get up and send this between 60 and $70 to you. I can't even wait for a post office order in the morning. The Lord will take it safe. Oh, they'd been enough to buy a coffin. And I kneeled to that little grave, and I said, Robert, can you hear me? Of course you can't. You're, you're up there somewhere. Robert, I haven't anybody else to ask. Do you want me to stay in China and try to be a missionary with a baby, or do you want me to go back to America? Of course, he couldn't answer. There was nothing but the flutter of the wind through the magnolias and the whir of the bright wings of a bird of paradise. And then the cry of the little baby. And I said, well, that's my answer. I picked her up, and I started back to the gate. And I got on board the ship and headed back to America. And the first night out, whoo, what a storm blew up. I felt the ocean was so big and wide, and I was so little and alone. As the waves piled up against the window or the porthole. And I felt, oh, God, my life is like this. It's a great ocean. You've saved me. You called me to work, but now it's all such a muddle and I don't know where to go or what to do. And then I heard the bell up on the captain's deck saying, ding dong. And then the watchman's voice saying, all's well. And then away up topside in the crow's nest, all's well. 
And the way on the stern, all's well. And I said, yes, Lord, Jesus, save your pilot me. So I took what I'd learned from Robert, and I gathered the children of the boat around me. Every day we had Sunday school, and I became astounded to see the big folks of the boat were there, too. Pretty soon I had almost the entire passenger list. When I got off the boat, someone stepped up and handed me an envelope, and it had quite a bit of money in it. And the purser, the sister, some of the passengers asked me to give you this. It'll help as you go along your way. Oh, thank God. Friends, don't you tell me there is no God. As months followed months, and as I tried for a while, finally, to get out of the work of the dear Lord, it is impossible. I'll be unable to go on with the Christian work. It just seems that uh, I could not possibly do it. I said, I'll marry and I'll settle down. I'll have a home for my little one. And then the glory and the joy of my precious son came into my heart. And I thought, now I certainly know I can never preach. But every day and every night, Jesus spoke to my soul, now will you go. Preach, preach, preach the word of God. I said, Lord, I can't go. I became ill and almost broken. And that settled it. Finally, I said yes to God. But not till I'd been taken off the operating table to die. Finally, as I lay dying, I said yes. Lord, I'll go. I took my suitcase and my baby, and I started off in the night, got a taxi cab, went to the depot, and I started out to preach the word of God. And I was invited to this town, that town, to preach the word of God. Preached outdoors under the trees, preached on the piazza, preached on the street corner. Wish you could see one of our street meetings, and we preached the word of God. I preached from Canada clear to Key West, Florida. By winter and by summer, in tents or in open air or in buildings, as the Lord opened up the ways, and the word of God began to go forth. Crowds came, and the multitudes gave their hearts to Jesus Christ, and the sick were healed, and oh, I was happy. Bless the Lord. And then came word from God to launch out into the deep. I began preaching in the big theaters, in the big auditorium, such as a Auditorium in St. Louis, I think many of you are familiar with it, seating some 18,000 people. God filled that from early morning until late at night. Such buildings as the Denver Municipal Auditorium, where the firemen would have to stay in at night after my meeting was over and hunt away up in the attic, up where the electric wires are, and drag the men down out of there and get the women from out of the restrooms downstairs who had barricaded themselves in the basement to be there for the next day's meeting for fear they couldn't get in. God brought people to the altar. There's a thousand people converted at one service. We would have to have the men first and then the women or vice versa. Friends, I'll tell you, it's a, ooh, it's a thriller to be a, a preacher. Why don't every one of you folks get converted and give your heart to God and come on and help me get the world born into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I feel I've done so little. I've preached in China back again, of course, later. I've preached in Egypt. I've preached in Greece. I've preached in the Philippines. I've preached in India. I've preached in Japan. I've preached throughout Canada and home and the British Isles, but I feel I've done nothing. I've seen hundreds of thousands of people saved. Everyone here that's been converted through this humble handmaiden or through someone who's been converted through these meetings, say amen. amen. God led me to come to California out of the midst of New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Rochester, New York, up and down the coast, and to buy this piece of land. It was just some vacant lots here. There was a sign on that said, Snap this corner. And it had a picture that looked like a piece of pie. I took my pencil, and on that piece of pie, I sketched out seven sections. Sketched out the balcony. Sketched out the ramparts. Sketched out the platform. Sketched out the baptistry. And then, by the grace of God, bought the land. As a result of my meetings and of answered prayer and much hard work by earnest laborers, Angela's temple went up, concrete and steel, tear up and tear, and the radio towers above it. And then the glory of God began to sweep through Angela's temple. Praise the Lord. This was only the beginning. The temple was often filled to capacity from morning until night. It is impossible to estimate the thousands of lives touched by this gifted woman. The altars were lined with the penitent. 
scores of people came to be baptized in water. Thousands were baptized with the Holy Spirit. The sick were prayed for and ministered to hour after hour. Miraculous healings occurred. With funds raised from the sale of miniature cement bags and donations, Life Bible College was built. The ministry grew rapidly after its opening in 1923. That same year, the prayer tower began its ministry of 24-hour-a-day prayer, followed one year later by the laying in of the cable for radio station KFSG. KFSG was the first radio station in the United States to be owned and operated by a church. In 1927, the commissary was opened to offer food and clothing without question to thousands of destitute people. She designed the four-square flag. Have you ever made a flag? I wish you fully understood our flag. The blood of Jesus is the red. The gold is the fire of the Pentecostal Holy Ghost. The blue is the divine life of the healer. The purple is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the red gleams the gold, blue and purple, fold on fold. For the rest of her life, Amy Semple McPherson continued to preach the message God had given her. She developed a ministry of vividly illustrated sermons. She wrote and composed songs, as well as helping to popularize the music of others. She also wrote sacred operas, such as Crimson Road and Bells of Bethlehem. Amy Semple McPherson was known for her keen sense of patriotism. She participated actively in the sale of war bonds and provided ministry to servicemen. How does one explain such phenomenal success? Amy Semple McPherson was not highly educated, but she was gifted by God for the ministry to which he called her. She was not perfect. She was frank to admit her mistakes. She once wrote, People sometimes speak of me as a much married evangelist, but I have lived with my husbands only about four and a half years of my life. I was married only a short time when Robert Semple died. After a short time ministering with me, Harold McPherson went back to the business world. After years and years, David Hutton came along. I thought it might be protection and home and love, but it did not work out that way. I had made a mistake in remarrying. Few women have been subjected to such distortion, exposure, and exaggeration by the news media as Amy Semple McPherson. In speaking of persecution, she said, in the meantime, you said, well, you've suffered a little bit of persecution. Oh, well, if you have time to think about it, I suppose I have. People say this about me and say that about me. I haven't time to either deny it or affirm it. All I can do is keep on preaching Jesus. The news of her death created great headlines in newspapers across the nation. Thousands upon thousands of people of her generation owed their knowledge of Jesus Christ directly to the message she so faithfully preached. By the time of her death, her ministry had so multiplied, the four-square gospel was being preached in 397 churches in the United States, 14 churches in Canada, and by 38 missionaries in 12 countries around the world. As we look back to the years of her dedicated life, we are assured that the message God gave her was indeed a perfect gospel, a complete gospel, for body, for soul, for spirit, and for eternity. It is based upon the truth that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. 